I'm, I'm going to get on to a bit more of the practical issues about tapering, although uh, there's a bit of stage setting. I'll go through that uh, quite quickly. Uh, I put this up here. Uh, these are not my actual patients, but there's to give people a sense of the diversity of the patients that you need to approach who are on uh, opioids that maybe shouldn't be on them or uh, who would benefit from tapering. And each case is different according to who is actually on the drugs. So we did a REMS training, and this is one of my conflicts. Uh, we're still offering uh, this COPE REMS training. If you want to hear some of the things that I'm going to talk about at greater length, it's a web-based training. So I'm going to briefly talk about the first couple of things about what do opioids do and who gets them, and because uh, that somewhat sets up uh, the kind of issues that Jane talked about, and then we'll get into some more details about how you support discontinuation or tapering from opioids. <coughs> so I like to remember Thomas De Quincey, who wrote The Confessions of an English Opium Eater. Oh, just subtle and all-conquering opium. We think of it as conquering pain, but it conquers the person, too. Uh, it conquers everything. And there's uh, no uh, more stern taskmaster uh, than that. I think we are. Uh, we've heard a lot this morning about how uh, overwhelming it can be as an addictive substance in the population as a whole. So um, I, I wanted to emphasize that, um, and I have a little, I'm a little challenged here with my list, but let me say that we have typically, classically thought of the endogenous opioid system as serving an analgesic function. And I really like that picture of the lion in chase is not going to feel any pain, nor are uh, people who are running away from the bear that's chasing them or the lion uh, in states of life-threatening uh, circumstance. Uh, the evolution has wisely given us the capacity to suppress pain till we're in a situation of safety. And I'm sure a lot of the healthcare providers here know the familiar story of somebody in a traumatic accident who says, I didn't actually feel pain till I got to the ER. Because before they got to the ER, something more important was going on, which is that they might die. And we used to try to test that with rats by throwing them into ice water and forcing them to swim. They thought they were going to die. But what in fact happened was their opioid system just dumped all the opioids into their body, near their bloodstream, and they had profound analgesia. So that is what we kind of know and expect from the endorphins. But it's really important that we understand that the endogenous opioids do a ton of other things because it will help us understand what's at stake for tapering. So we know that it's obviously involved in addiction to opioids, right? But if you listened carefully, you heard Melissa also saying that naltrexone is not just FDA approved for opioid addiction, it's approved for what else? Alcohol. Why is it approved for alcohol addiction? Because alcohol reward is ultimately opioid mediated. So same thing with virtually every drug of abuse, the opioid system is involved on some level. We now know that depression, we think of depression as a psychological thing to the extent we think it's biological. We think norepinephrine, we think uh, serotonin, we think dopamine, which is what antidepressants do. But now John Carzubieta's work out of Michigan and a bunch of other people have shown that depression and other mental health phenomena are associated with damage, aberrancy to the endogenous opioid system. Depression, stress, borderline personality disorder, cognition, learning, and memory are all tied in with that. We all know that heroin addicts have no sex drive, right? They're unable, they have hypogonadism. But in fact, all sorts of uh, endocrine and sexual and fertility functions are tied with the endogenous opioid system. Jane hinted at the fact that our very most basic social bond is the maternal infant bond. And it has been shown in, in both mice and primates to not form if you block the functions of the endogenous opioid system. So we think people who are taking opioids to address their social pain, their broken social bonds, are abusing it, whereas people who are taking opioids to address their physical pain, the fact that they have a broken leg rather than a broken heart, they're using it as opposed to abusing it. But 
From the standpoint of the endogenous opioid system and its evolutionary history, both are completely legitimate functions. That is, social bonds and analgesia are both functions of the endogenous opioid system. Goes on and on, gastrointestinal, renal, cardiovascular responses. So there's a lot of things that are gonna happen as you know, we drown the system in exogenous opiates and we start taking them away. It's a challenging situation on many levels. And this is just a picture showing that new opioid receptors are not limited to the classic sensory regions like the thalamus, but regions of the brain that are really subserve emotional functions, the, the cingulate, the caudate, the amygdala, which is a source of mood, anger, impulsivity, also very heavily laden with new opioid receptors. So I'm gonna quickly review a little bit of pharmacoepidemiology. We know that long-term opioid therapy was escalating at least through 2010, maybe it peaked in 2012. Uh, the vast majority, but it's very important to think about that the long-term opioid therapy population is highly self-selected. Most ideal candidates for opioid therapy, the ones that you're supposed to put on opioid therapy, quit. The older patient with focal pain in their knees, they don't usually like opioids. They quit them. Unfortunately, the three-fourths of patients started on extended release or long-acting opioids don't fill a second prescription. So even the people we try to give OxyContin say, no, thank you. Most do. And unfortunately, of the people who do continue, they're a self-selected group, and they have a lot of characteristics that make them higher risk. They have a lot higher substance abuse and mental health disorders. They're quite common in long-term and high-dose users. That's been demonstrated in multiple health systems. And because the lower-risk patients quit, the long-term or chronic opioid therapy cohort is progressively enriched with higher-risk patients. So I've called that adverse selection, and it means that despite all the treatment guidelines that we've seen that urge careful selection of opioid patients for long-term opioid therapy, what we do is actually get the opposite of adverse selection, where we get a pairing of the very highest risk patients with the highest risk regimens, which I think plays an important role in linking the trends in use, abuse, and overdose. Um, who discontinues? The fact is that most people quit before they get to 90 days, but once you get to 90 days, not that many people quit. It's a pretty important decision point where the people who get to that point are, I think, locked into this dependent, self-perpetuating nature of opioid therapy. And a couple of studies have indicated that unfortunately not good things, high dose, evidence of opioid pr misuse predict who goes on. Um, we did a repeat study with a nationwide VA study where once again, of the people who get to 90 days, 70% continued for years, <laughs> predicted by high dose, multiple opioids, multiple pain problems, tobacco use. Although unlike our uh, non-VA sample, uh, other substance abuse and mental health disorders didn't predict. I think that's because the VA is kind of more on top of that than other places. And other prospective studies have shown something similar. So the long-term group has multiple problems. Um, we <clears throat> just recently did a study uh, where we randomized patients to an opioid taper support program. Uh, <coughs> it's a little hard to read this, so I'm gonna talk about the program uh, elsewhere. <coughs> um, but let me give you the rationale behind our support intervention. So it turns out, even though this group is bonded to their opioids and fearful of getting off of them, a lot of them are quite ambivalent. Uh, we did a study at uh, Group Health in Kaiser where even among the patients who said these opioids, and we're, this is just long-term users, uh, nearly half, 43% said, I would quit if I could, even if they said that the opioids were helpful for the pain. So it's an indicator of a lot of ambivalence. Even the people who are on would love to be off if they felt there was a viable alternative. I mean, my favorite analogy, in many, many ways, opioid cessation is like smoking cessation. Same repeated attempts at failure, same ambivalence, same emotional issues. And one of the huge things is that uh, people have great fear 
of pain and withdrawal symptoms. I mean, you have to remember, this is a very select group that has kind of been brought to their knees. You know, their life has been stopped by their pain. And they feel like they're surviving. And you're raising the prospect of a life completely stopped, again, at least to them. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, but I think the fear, I'll show you the date, some data about this, but the fear of pain and withdrawal actually ends up being much more important than actually what they experience, the pain and withdrawal symptoms. Um, and what we decided based on other work in pain self-management is that we're going to have to do two things for our patients. First of all, we have to establish the importance of tapering, that this is something that's important and worthwhile to do. We have to engage you in the process as this, this is a voluntary program. You have to want to do it. And then you have to believe that you can do it, that there is some possibility of success. That, you know, I mean, you may want to do something you think is impossible and you're not going to go forward with it. But if you think it's important and you think it's possible, then you're going to go ahead with it. Uh, so what did we do in this uh, trial? Uh, prescription opioid taper intervention, that's why we called it POT. So we had an engagement strategy. One thing we did is we screened patients with a scale that I... Uh, developed with Michael von Korff called the Prescription Opioids Difficulty Scale. And it is a scale you ask the patient about the problems that they're having with their opioids. And it turns out to generate two scores. One is psychosocial problems. So the people will endorse items like, these pills are making me sedated. I'm uh, depressed because of these medications. Or I am have uh, other uh, problems. Also, we have a scale of opioid control concerns where you talk about, oh, I'm worried about controlling my opioid use. My wife thinks I'm addicted, etc. And we showed that that is independent of actual substance abuse diagnoses. So what we did is we used, we asked these people in order to elicit from them the downside from their point of view of being on opioids. So they have a lot of problems that they will actually tell you about, maybe more so on a questionnaire than face-to-face, -face, certainly before they know that you're going to start talking about tapering, but they'll volunteer that they do have troubles. We had an engagement video. We uh, videotaped uh, three patients who had successfully tapered off opioids, because I think that many patients don't actually believe that it's possible. Or they've never seen anybody that's successfully tapered. And so actually seeing somebody talk about the fact that their life is better now that they're off opioids was telling. Particularly because we followed it up with a motivational interviewing session where using both self-solicited and then the fact that they'd viewed the video, we used those as prime primers for the pump. And then our PA talked to the patient about their own interest in tapering and their own aspirations for being opioid free as a way to launch them into the process. Then, because I'm quite convinced that in many cases these opioids are in fact serving as treatment for psychiatric problems, PTSD, depression, anxiety problems, even if they're on psych meds as well as the opioids, oftentimes I found that when you pull off the wet, cold, wet blanket of opioids, a lot of things can come out. I mean, classically, the symptoms of opioid withdrawal are anxiety and insomnia. But people with underlying psych disorders can be getting into stuff that's more serious. Their PTSD can come back. They can become suicidal again. They can start having panic attacks again. And what we tried to do was anticipate that, provide people relief with non-opioid medications, generally antidepressants. The thing I used most often was nortriptyline because it does promote sleep continuity, it does relieve pain, it does relieve depression and anxiety, and it doesn't often exacerbate PTSD much. So it, it helped, and we very closely tracked both prior to the taper and during the taper anxiety and depression symptoms. And I'll tell you that we found that virtually nobody got into trouble or had a big pain escalation during opioid taper unless they also had an escalation in depression and anxiety symptoms. They come together. Then after we did that, then we used a program of skills training. 
pain self-management skills training developed by my colleague Judy Turner, who's a very accomplished pain psychologist, following cognitive behavioral therapy principles, giving people some tools to address pain flares, to help them feel not powerless in the face of their pain problem once we begin to pull away their opioids. So that, as I mentioned, was adapted from full-fledged chronic pain CBT delivered by a psychologist, but we were interested in something that might be more generalizable into the primary care context, so we had it delivered by a physician's assistant. It included pacing, relaxation training, flare management. Then uh, let me talk about our taper schedule, because I think part of it was very well thought out and part was not so well thought out. So initially, we thought that we could do 10% a week. When we had been tapering patients during my early career in our inpatient and then day hospital pain program, we managed to use a methadone blinded pain cocktail to taper people 10% a day. So we thought 10% a week would be fine. It turns out to probably be too fast for many people to be tapering on an outpatient basis, but the, which is the part I got wrong. The part I got right was we uh, said to all the patients that if it's going too fast for you, you can pause. You can say, I don't want to go down this week. If this is challenging enough for me, I don't want to go down any further. But we did not allow people to raise their dose. I mean, once the dose went down, it stayed down. That Well, they could, of course, leave the study and go back to their doc and get more meds. But it went down, and then it could stay there. And in fact, we had people go down a little bit, and then they just stayed there for the rest of the study. But a lot of times, in a few weeks, they were ready to go down a little bit more. And that meant that it was sort of a one-way door downward. So it didn't go back up and down, because just like pain patients who get boom and bust activity, I think there's a real tendency to go kind of boom and bust on opioid dosing as well. And that seemed to be workable. It didn't force people into a feeling of being out of control, because there was like inexorably being forced down every week. On the other hand, there was progress being made. You know, as I tell people a lot, I don't care what your rate of taper is as long as the slope is going down. A slow taper is still a taper. Okay, um, Okay. so this, I kind of went through this. I'd forgotten that this, this is the pods, and it's freely, well, I'm happy to send you a copy or, uh, if you want to use it. Um, and our engagement video, we actually had two different segments of the video. The first one that were shown prior to people getting randomized focused on the end result, which is what is life like once you're off opioids. And what we heard both from the people in the video and from the subjects that we have in our trial is the word zombie a lot. Um, people talked a lot about the fact that they became much more emotionally and responsive and socially engaged, cognitively more there, and you know, the spouses were great fans of the program because the people kind of woke up. Um, they often uh, didn't, they didn't talk about their pain being worse, but they did talk about uh, their emotions being better and zombie effect being less. And then once people were randomized into our taper support, uh, we had a second video that focused kind of on the process of tapering, like what are the challenges of going through opioid taper. And they did talk about difficulties with increasing pain or insomnia or anxiety or depression and how they dealt with it, because obviously all these people succeeded at that. They, they successfully uh, completed taper. So uh, just to give you a, a glimpse into our process, this is a study flow sheet about how we tracked patients through our taper. Uh, this is a patient who started out on 160 of methadone and 32 of Dilaudid. This is one of our highest dosed patients when they started. So starting a morphine equivalent dose was 2,000. Uh, this person obviously had some uh, other uh, mental health issues. Uh, uh, she was on diazepam, venlafaxine, and tizanidine, uh, and a trimethobenzamide already. And this is how we went. These are the session numbers. We basically had uh, 15 sessions with her. This is at baseline when she was on 160 of methadone. You can watch 
almost everybody in our trial, we gave them a choice of tapering long or short acting first. They chose to taper the long acting first. And you know with the methadone multiplier effect, as you bring down the methadone dose, that changes the MEDs in a major way quite quickly. Um, her dilaudid dose stayed the same throughout the whole trial, but we got her from 160 to 50 of methadone. So a couple things to note. A, the long actings came down, and B, she didn't get completely off. I mean, we didn't, quote, complete the job, and we didn't insist on it. Way at the beginning of our trial, we knew we had to either, you know, decide that people uh, were going to get a time-limited intervention or that we're going to force everybody off, and we just decided we're going to get as far as we can in what was essentially 22 weeks. We also tracked uh, depression scores, and as you can see, uh, 16 is in the moderately depressed range. That's where this person started, and this person did get uh, her meds adjusted, but she's already on a very high dose of enlafaxine, so not super easy to uh, improve depression treatment. But as you can see, her depression scores went up for a while, then went down, then came up somewhat again, and her anxiety scores did somewhat the same. Pain intensity, right? Pain's supposed to get worse when you come off opioids. She started at a six, she ended up at a two. Pain interference, she started at an eight, she ended up at a two. So, I mean, I don't know that we really understand what the whole process of opioid taper is, but it's not as bleak as a, most patients think it's gonna be. This is another uh, patient who uh, came in on uh, 120 of OxyContin and then another 80 of OxyCodone. Uh, and as you can see, this person got down only a little bit on the OxyContin and also just a little bit on the OxyCodone. Uh, however, uh, depression got a lot better, anxiety got a lot better, pain intensity got a lot better, pain interference got a lot better. So. I would say our impressions from the trial process is that I'm impressed as to how similar opioid cessation is to smoking to cessation. It's a lot tougher during the process, less so long-term, although to be honest, we don't have great long-term data about how things. Insomnia and anxiety emerge during taper, sometimes more substantial issues with depression, PTSD, and borderline. Um, we relied on nortriptyline and other psychotropics. Um, we definitely did not add benzodiazepines. We discouraged them trying to do the two tapers at the same time. We basically just kept that stable. We used early taper to build skills and confidence. Um, and patients limit their opioid taper for many reasons. They just don't, they can't take it all at once. But uh, pain per se was rarely the only reason. So what results did we get? We're still analyzing the data. We have some missing data problems and some statistical challenges, but we're in the middle of writing up the trial. Let me just give you some hint of what the challenge is. We got referred 145 patients as eligible and interested, but we only randomized 35. That's, I think, an index of how ambivalent and fearful this group is, because three out of, you know, I told my doctor I might be interested, but now that you're asking me to start today, I don't think so. 35 said yes, you know, a few were ineligible, but most declined. So it was a group that was female, middle-aged, and white, basically. They were pretty uh, long-term opioid users, about 11 years, uh, and relatively uh, well-educated. A little over half had at least uh, some college after high school. Uh, they were on a fair bit, 200 in the taper support group, about 240 in the usual care group. Um, and when, when we looked at uh, the dose, you know, the two groups, what is the final dose in one group compared to the dose in the other group, adjusted for the baseline dose, uh, we didn't quite get to statistical significance. P is 0.1, not 0.05. Uh, however, if we look at it somewhat differently, and I can't exactly explain to you why one works and one doesn't, but we were able to accomplish a 46% dose reduction from baseline dose in the taper support group as opposed to an 18% in the usual care group. So about three times as much on a per patient. Probably even more interesting is the fact that in both groups, non-significant, but in both groups, pain scores went what rhymes with clown? Down. So the taper support group 
uh, went down from an average pain score of 5.7 to 4.7, and the usual care group went from an initial pain intensity score of 6.3 to 5.8. Interestingly, pain interference declined significantly in the taper support group. So they reported a pain interference of 6 out of 10, and it went down to 4.5. The usual care group didn't change much from 6.6 .6 to 6.4, and these two groups are different. So the, the trial, in the context of overall policy, it's difficult to recruit. I think we would need to, if we're going to do a bigger trial, we need a more robust engagement strategy. Um, we are debating about whether to include people who have a more compelled, less fully voluntary taper because particularly I think in safety net clinics, a lot of the tapers are not fully voluntary. We have to figure out how to really uh, get a taper support strategy that would be useful to the broad uh, population. So as Jane made the point, opioids are diverse and important functions and so opioid tapers can affect many different functions and present patients with many challenges besides escalating pain levels. Uh, the epidemiology of long-term opioid use suggests opioids are treating various mental health and substance abuse problems. However, our, our preliminary data from our pilot study suggests that taper support can be successfully used to facilitate dose reduction without increasing pain intensity and may in fact decrease pain interference. So, thank you. <laughs>